Hello, and welcome to NEHA's live chat series, COVID-19 Essential Functions of the Environmental Health Profession. My name is Laura Wildy. I am the Senior Program Analyst in Food Safety with the National Environmental Health Association. It is my pleasure to facilitate this call today. Please note this webinar is being recorded. If you are not okay with this being recorded, you may disconnect at this time. All participants will be in listen only mode. We anticipate time at the end of the webinar for questions. Please submit any questions you have in the Q&A box and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. We are pleased to have you all on the call as we hear from Dr. Robert Tokes, Director of the Division of Foodborne, Waterborne and Environmental Diseases in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Today, we observe the second World Annual World Food Safety Day, which occurs each year on June 7th. World Food Safety Day highlights the importance of food safety and public health, bringing attention to key issues and topics to reduce the risks of waterborne and foodborne illnesses. The environmental health profession, to include food safety, is profoundly local. Significant efforts are constantly underway to prevent and mitigate foodborne and waterborne illnesses throughout the country as state, local, tribal, and territorial environmental health programs work tirelessly towards a reduction in illness. The fruits of this labor are a direct result of an informed and empowered workforce. It is an honor to introduce you today to Dr. Robert Tokes. Dr. Tokes is director of the CDC division charged with the prevention and control of foodborne, waterborne, and fungal infections. The division monitors the frequency of these infections in the United States, investigates outbreaks, develops the science and promotes the policies that will help prevent the disease, disability and deaths that they cause. Dr. Tokes graduated from Yale University in 1975 and received his medical degree from Vanderbilt Medical School. He completed an internal medicine residency, trained at CDC in the Epidemic Intelligence Service and joined CDC staff in 1985. His interests include bacterial enteric diseases, epidemiology and pathogenesis of infectious diseases, epidemiologic and clinical consequences of bacterial genetic exchange, antimicrobial use and resistance to antimicrobial agents, and teaching epidemiologic methods. His faculty appointments include the School of Public Health and Department of Biology at Emory University, Atlanta. Dr. Tokes has written slash co-authored 301 journal articles, letters, and book chapters. We're certainly pleased to have you on our webinar today, Dr. Tokes. The floor is yours. Well, good afternoon uh, to all. Uh, it is an honor for me and a pleasure to participate in this webinar in these unusual times. And thanks very much to Dave Dijak and Jesse Bliss for the invitation, and Laura Wildy for making, uh, for facilitating, facilitating this conversation. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> start with just a summary of where we were as of around late February in this, in this uh, year, and then continue with a few observations about the impact that COVID has had on our surveillance. The estimates that we've had for some time are, are that foodborne illnesses are really an important public health problem. 48 million people become ill, 128,000 are hospitalized, and 3,000 die every year at an estimated annual cost of uh, lost, uh, uh, lost wages and health care uh, costs of 15.6 billion. Our theory of prevention is not to have a vaccine against everything, but to understand transmission well enough to intervene and prevent it. That is the results of actions by regulators in, in public health and our, our partners in industry and consumers themselves. We can help drive progress with foodborne disease outbreak investigations and attribution studies that point to where the prevention arena, the points of prevention might actually make a difference. And that can lead to changes in industry practices, consumer behavior and regulatory policies. Between 1996 and 2007, there was important progress made after improved surveillance and investigations, then found many points of intervention, but relatively little progress since then in reducing illness. Let's see. 
Yes, here we are. At CDC, we have uh, several, sorry, I skipped one slide too far. There, and I went too far back. CDC, we have several activities in food safety. We conduct national surveillance for the infections often transmitted by food. We in investigate and control outbreaks to stop them and prevent future illnesses especially focusing on the multi-state outbreaks, though we can provide individual states with emergency assistance on request. We support state and local health departments, global and other partners to fulfill their primary roles in food safety. We innovate with uh, advanced technologies to improve surveillance and to address diagnostic challenges. And we hope collectively together to drive illness prevention policy with data analyses and our partnerships. <clears throat> there are, of course, many players in food safety, and this multiplayer, multi-agency effort includes the caregivers and the clinical labs that make the diagnoses and report the specific illnesses, the state and local health departments that receive those reports and interview patients uh, that subtype pathogens in the state public health labs to find dispersed outbreaks, uh, that investigate and control events within the state, and have many, many ongoing prevention and monitoring activities. Uh, many of you are deeply involved in those. CDC is the lead national public health agency conducting national level disease surveillance and as I mentioned, the multi-state outbreak detection and investigations. FDA and USDA FSIS are regulatory partners, trace suspected foods back to sources across the country or the world in those outbreak investigations, they assess production and monitoring facilities, and they have also many ongoing prevention and monitoring efforts. At the federal level, we are supported in several ways, sorry for this, uh, through a line, budget lines that are specific to food safety, that are more general for the emerging infectious diseases, that support advanced molecular detection efforts and that are dedicated to combating antibiotic resistant bacteria. We use these to support state and large city health departments through the Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity Cooperative Grant mechanism, and we train local and state staff through several platforms, including the Council to Improve Foodborne Outbreak Response, or C4, which has just issued the third edition of uh, a volume of uh, uh, recommended uh, outbreak response activities and the Centers of Excellence in Food Safety Program. We convene partners. We had hoped to have our large integrated foodborne outbreak response and management conference this March. Unfortunately, at the last minute, because of COVID, we had to cancel that. Now, I mentioned that uh, things have been decreasing since 1996, which was when active surveillance for foodborne disease in the program known as FoodNet began. Uh, that's a collaboration among CDC, 10 FoodNet sites around the country, which you can see on the map here, uh, the FDA and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Food Safety and Inspection Service. We're tracking eight infections that are often spread through foods and providing reliable and up-to-date data on illness trends. And here I have illustrated four of those pathogens, E. coli 0157, which in the first decade of this surveillance declined by 49% and has declined slightly since then, although not as impressively. Campylobacter, which declined 43% in the first decade. Listeria, which declined 43% in the past decade. And Salmonella, which has been rather disappointingly unchanged, uh, although we, in fact, even a little bit increasing over the last uh, two decades. Now on the Campylobacter slide, you can see the um, red line shows an increasing number of diagnoses being made now not by culture, which is what I'm showing in general on these slides, but with culture-independent diagnostic tests. And as these tests become more commonly used, they give you a rapid diagnosis, but they don't give the isolate. Uh, we are seeing that alone is driving numbers up, although we actually think 
in fact, Campylobacter is staying relatively constant. Now, in that line of Salmonella being relatively constant over two decades, there is actually a success buried in that, which is that two serotypes of Salmonella that were formerly very common, Typhimurium, which was the second, at first most common for some time, and then the second most common, has now dropped 64%. And the upper graph shows Salmonella Heidelberg, which used to be four or five, and has dropped 92% in, uh, as of 2018. These substantial drops are probably related to the use of a live vaccine against Typhimurium in chickens. And the use of this vaccine in chickens uh, targeted the, the, the serotypes in, those, in that reservoir and let us uh, really make an amazing amount of prevention possible. And I think this is perhaps a useful model for us to think about preventing other serotypes of Salmonella to figure out which is the, the specific reservoir and tackle that. Sorry, the uh, transition to the next slide seems to be a little bit slow. Also that same year when FoodNet started, PulseNet itself started. And PulseNet is our national network for molecular surveillance bacterial infections. This uh, is a system based in all the state health department laboratories in Puerto Rico and in a number of large city health department laboratories. PulseNet. Uh, gathers the clinical isolates from the clinical labs in each state or large city and tests them using standard molecular methods. The data from those pathogens then is sent to a centralized database at CDC where we monitor for clusters of illness with the same molecular fingerprint. Uh, and using this, we have investigated approximately 200 multi-state clusters that were identified annually. A smaller number of them were clearly defined as outbreaks and uh, traced to specific sources so they could be controlled. Now, the method that we were using for this subtyping since 1996 was called pulse field gel electrophoresis or PFGE, which was state of the art in the mid 1990s. That method has been replaced Last summer, we introduced whole genome sequencing as the PulseNet standard. And I'm glad to say that after a big push in all the states uh, that by summer of last year, all states were certified, trained and certified and able to use whole genome sequencing. This gives us improved precision and detection. And we had anticipated that this might double the number of clusters identified and outbreaks under investigation, meaning a lot more work for everybody. We can also use the sequence to predict antibiotic resistance. So after several years of preparation, this happened. And we are expecting more outbreaks, and in fact, initially did see more outbreaks and more successful epidemiologic investigations to identify targets for prevention. This is part of our continuing investment and improvement process in public health laboratories. Now integrating whole genome sequencing into routine workflow and building an IT infrastructure to support the greater amount of data. The rapid internet upload speed turns out to be a vital part of this uh, because that internet speed connection, which we're witnessing right now every time I change slides, is a key factor in being able to reliably uh, share the data from sequencing. And we're also encouraging states as they adopt other new laboratory technologies like mass spec, mass spectroscopy uh, to rapidly identify organisms. Clinical diagnostic laboratories, meanwhile, continue to adopt the culture independent diagnostic tests or CIDTs, which give rapid diagnosis, but not an isolate unless somebody goes and cultures that same specimen. In public health, we still need the isolates to do the whole genome sequencing. And so somebody needs to do that culturing of the positive specimens. We call that reflex culture 
if we're going to find and investigate dispersed multi-state outbreaks and track the success of our control measures. The burden of this reflex culture falls more and more on public health laboratories. We're also trying to make continuous investment and improvement in epidemiology and environmental health offices, anticipating that more outbreaks are being identified by whole genome sequencing, more investigations in each state, more multi-state outbreaks as well, and more suspect foods to trace back to sources and more sources to assess. We're also uh, working with CSTE to address issues around the use of culture independent diagnostic tests in public health practice, including how best to use them to guide decisions around excluding children from daycare or excluding workers from sensitive occupations without necessarily having a positive culture on which to base those decisions. The new landscape that is being revealed by whole genome sequencing is interesting and it's bringing us new lessons. We're finding more outbreaks and we're finding them while they are smaller. Uh, they are identifying familiar sources and new sources. A few years ago, I'd never heard of Kratom. I had no idea what it was, but we had a large and messy salmonella outbreak related to Kratom, a uh, uh, shrub, the leaves of a shrub from Southeast Asia uh, that people take to control pain. Uh, pig ear dog treats, another novel source, and ice cream for listeria was an early one. And we're also identifying events that fall between the classic acute outbreak and the routine, more or less, background. We've seen strains that reoccur, like the E. coli 157 and romaine lettuce every spring and fall. We've seen strains that emerge and spread and are of concern in a particular uh, source like Salmonella infantis and poultry. We've seen strains that are persisting over several years uh, that we can be very clear is the same strain because we're using sequencing like drug-resistant Shigella in the homeless or in MSM populations. And we're calling these, collectively we're calling these the rep strains that are defined by whole genome sequencing. <clears throat> Focusing more effort on them is part of how we can get to more prevention Just to introduce a couple of these, uh, I mentioned uh, romaine lettuce and multidrug resistant E. coli 157. Back in the spring of 2018, there was a large nationwide outbreak linked to romaine, uh, 210 cases in 36 states, uh, five deaths, 27 cases of hemolytic uremic syndrome, the largest 0157 outbreak in the last decade. 87% said they ate romaine lettuce, far more than we would expect. And this was traced to approximately 23 fields. None, only one was traced with certainty, but the others contributed and may have been part of it across a span of 50 miles in the Yuma growing area. And this ended after repeated warnings and the end of the harvest. Looking at those sequences with whole genome sequencing, we could see that there was a main clade and then a small second clade. And that main clade had a history. Uh, back in 2017, it had caused two outbreaks. One was swimming in a lake and one was related to a salad bar at a university in the Midwest. And since then, we saw cases in 2019, also in the springtime. So this is one that if it occurs again, we will want to jump on it. It is a, a, a strain of concern. This is a reoccurring rep strain. And the second example that I mentioned already was the, uh, oh, Is, is the Salmonella infantis uh, strain that is related to poultry. And this is a little bit more of a complicated story, but our first super resistant strains were seen back in 2012 and they were people returning from Peru. They were, they, the strain has decreased susceptibility or is fully resistant to 10 different agents, making it a really strikingly resistant strain, difficult to treat. Um, the first non-travel associated human case was in 2014, and then it's increased in 17 and 18, and increased rapidly, and now represents 30% of all of this serotype in humans in the US, and is driving Infantis to actually increase overall into the number six position among Salmonella serotypes. On the chicken side, 
USDA first noticed this in, in chickens in this country in 2013 and also saw a rapid increase in chickens in 2017 and after, representing essentially the same time period as the humans. Um, and we now have begun finding it in Turkey. And we've met with the Chicken Council several times in the last couple of years talking about this and how pre-harvest investigations and interventions are needed. And this may be a really good candidate for a vaccine to be developed for poultry. So that's a, that's a rep strain, sorry. I'm just pointing out the big peak that occurred in 18 there. Um, and a final example of persisting strain, seven infections caused by the same listeria strain as determined by whole genome sequencing that occurred over a three year span in five states in the south, well, in the, in the eastern half of the country. The median age was 75, four of the seven were hospitalized, one died, and the story was eggs. Um, and it was eggs served in several locations, but the same strain was found in environmental samples taken during uh, inspection of a large egg boiling facility in February 2019, which was an early reason to think about eggs, and then again when they recurred in December of 2019. In the mono, the listeria monocytogenase was present in the peeling room. It looks like it was there for many months, maybe several years. And those bulk hard boiled eggs got used in many other ready to eat products. The uh, public and commercial sector was warned, production was temporarily halted. And then it ultimately, I think, uh, permanently halted and all hard boiled eggs from that facility were recalled. Here was a good illustration of the need for vigilant public health surveillance and careful environmental monitoring and sanitation in a production plant. What we had anticipated doing this year and we're still working on um, is uh, uh, we have repeated the food net population survey and we will be preparing new estimates of the burden of illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths and preparing new summary of incidents by pathogen uh, using food net data. Uh, modeling to adjust for the effects of CIDTs on reporting so that we can accurately track trends and estimating attribution um, by specific food source using outbreak data, and now we'll be using whole genome sequencing to provide even more, uh, a, a better attribution of the sporadic cases. And I list here several websites uh, where our surveillance data are now available online. <clears throat> there are challenges of this, challenges in making the laboratory workflow fit in public health but it's an opportunity to attract a new generation of laboratory scientists who are excited by this. Uh, there's a surge in detected clusters. That means more investigations. We're going to need more staff at all levels. Uh, and big data puts a strain on the IT infrastructure at CDC and in state health departments. And there's the challenge of culture independent diagnostic tests, I think I already mentioned. There are opportunities to find and solve more outbreaks, to draw attribution information out of surveillance data and to target the specific strains, the rep strains or others for research and prevention. Um, we were also finding uses of whole genome sequencing beyond foodborne surveillance and outbreak detection. It can be used for other pathogens and it's in each state now. Uh, preparing for the future using more advanced laboratory methods, metagenomic methods will be built using sequence data we're collecting now and developing the next generation of diagnostic methods that will give us all the information that public health needs directly from the patient sample. That's about a five-year project. Now, I want to turn, COVID has obviously brought many changes. Um, public health resources are absorbed in the tracking and control efforts. Clinical laboratories are now doing fewer tests and doing sending fewer strains for whole genome sequencing which is really, I'll give you some examples of this in just a moment, but it's a striking uh, observation now. So PulseNet has been getting fewer isolates and sequences submitted to it than before in the PFG era. And the number of possible multi-state outbreaks to investigate has not doubled as expected, but remains similar or even lower than in previous years. I think we can be glad that we have whole genome sequencing giving us better sensitivity with a smaller, so that with a smaller number of sequences studied and strains studied in, hold, in state public health laboratories, we're still 
able to find uh, about as many clusters as we did in the past. Recesses, resources at local and state levels to help investigate them are stretched thin, and nobody knows better than, than you all, I'm sure. And what's happening is that people are avoiding direct contact with clinical health care and with labs, and that's one big reason why we think we're getting fewer isolates. But we also have to ask, could it be that the actual number of diarrheal infections has decreased because restaurants and caterers are closed, school and childcare settings are closed, and there have been profound changes in food sources and food habits. I mentioned that the number of sequences submitted to PulseNet has dropped. PulseNet has dropped. Here on the left, you can see the number of salmonella isolates uploaded, the sequences uploaded from isolates from humans to PulseNet. Uh, the blue line is the five-year average. You can see it was running about 600 per week and then it gently starts to increase when the warm weather arrives. The red line is this year, which was tracking pretty well with the blue line until week nine or 10, which is part way into March. Then it's, it starts to drop, it drops sharply, um, and then only in the last two weeks, it started to increase again, so that uh, in week 21, the end of June, it was 79% of expected. But for much of this time, it's been down by close to 50% of expected. On the right hand, we can see listeria uploads, sequencing from listeria. And you can see that the, uh, uh, the five-year average in blue for the preceding five years is really pretty much the same as what we're observing this year. Now, those are very ill people in general who get blood culture because they have a very serious infection and are hospitalized. Almost all of them are hospitalized and that apparently has not changed uh, during this time period. But those uh, salmonella cases certainly have and one reason I mentioned that I mentioned was that the number of emergency room visits has dropped at the same time. Here are some data that uh, Connecticut makes available. One of our food net states, uh, the black line that sort of jitters across in a horizontal way is the number of emergency room visits in Connecticut every day uh, since January 1st. And you can see that uh, it doesn't change very much. It's pretty flat, around uh, uh, 4,500, 5,000 visits a day. And the bars show you that starting shortly after the first case of COVID-19 was reported in Connecticut, they drop they drop rather substantially. They drop approximately 50%. And that's the, that's the current situation. Um, and our kinetic colleagues tell us that half of the visits that are still occurring are related to COVID-19. So non-COVID visits actually have dropped by 75%. That's one sign. Here's national level data, a similar of emergency room visits from the National Syndromic Surveillance Program. Here you can see the lighter line that goes across horizontally. That's what has been observed last year. And the dark blue line that goes along until about week 12 or week 13 and then drops dramatically is this year. And uh, in this, uh, at the height of our concern about the, the COVID uh, epidemic uh, overtopping uh, hospitals, it decreased by 42%. This was just published at the end of last week in the MMWR, and it's starting to recover again. So it's not too far from what we're seeing in our salmonella uploads. Now, these, this means we have more challenges. One of them is somehow we need to be in cognizant of people's concerns about the cost, cognizant of people's concerns about the risk to them of making direct personal contact with the healthcare system, we need to find a way to start encouraging people to bring specimens to clinical labs. Uh, there are an array uh, so that we can have the isolates uh, that will help us find outbreaks. Uh, there are an array of other issues that have been brought up that I'm sure everyone has been concerned with and aware of. Safe home delivery practices as retail and restaurant food service deliveries expand dramatically. Managing in the future, managing or now managing food safety in restaurants as states begin a phased reopening of establishments that have been closed for weeks or even months. 
balance and how to do that safely and how to re-engage with food safety inspections of establishments that now may include whether or not they are adhering to uh, the social distancing recommendations by the health departments. Uh, there's a whole array of CDC guidance around COVID-19. I'm not going to try to summarize, but it's at this website and new, new documents are being added on an almost daily basis. One of the most recent was uh, the new guidance for agricultural worker safety that uh, went up on this last week. We are here, we continue with our partners in state and local health departments to detect, investigate, and control foodborne outbreaks. Uh, those issues have not gone away, although uh, they are not uh, as commonly in the news. And uh, we appreciate the efforts that everyone is making. Uh, to sum up, the whole genome sequencing-based surveillance that we introduced last year is a major step forward, giving us more precise subtyping plus enhanced patient interviews and traceback. More outbreaks and sources will be detected and controlled because of this and more food safety gaps found and corrected. And we are planning now a more systematic approach to those uh, reoccurring, emerging and persisting strains, the rep strains, and as I pointed out, whole genome sequencing can be used for other pathogens. In fact, the uh, same platform may be used uh, to start doing sequencing of COVID-19 viruses. This is a bridge to the future when public health will have culture independent tools to rapidly provide all the data needed directly from a patient sample. And we expect this to help us define new targets for prevention within the food safety system and to continue uh, driving down the incidence of foodborne infections amid the fresh challenges brought to us by the COVID-19 pandemic. So, uh, with that, let me say thank you very much for your attention. And uh, uh, if you have time for questions, I do. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tokes, for that insightful lecture. You know, the use of advanced technologies such as whole genome sequencing and systems like FoodNet, and NARMS, and NORS all really help to support the efforts of our local environmental health programs. And, you know, we at NEHA are committed to the environmental health workforce, and we're extremely grateful for the opportunity to have you speak today on food safety and our ever evolving public health approach. It does look like we are over time. Um, so I do want to be respectful of your time, but if there are questions that have come up, I'm happy to share them with you and perhaps we can share the answers to those questions with our attendees after this webinar. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so Dr. Tokes, we sincerely thank you for your time and valuable insights on food safety during today's lecture and thank all of the participants for their time and participation and we hope that you all stay well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all.